If you have your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 2. I want to challenge us this year. I want to encourage us this year in this particular thought being rooted in Jesus Christ. Now, most of us are familiar with a tree or trees. Maybe you've tried to even take down a tree before. Perhaps as a child, perhaps you grabbed a stick and you begin to hit the base of a tree with a stick. Probably to no avail. As you get a little older, we try different methods and different techniques to remove trees. Some of us who have access to equipment will use things called chainsaws. Or other heavy equipment like a tractor, a skid steer, a bobcat, or even a bumper of a vehicle. It was years ago here at First Baptist Church that we had a staff member who was tasked with pulling out a couple of shrubs, not tree shrubs, on the property. And they had the bright idea, and it was not me. All right, just clear that up right now before you judge me, all your judgmental faces I can see. Just sit there. I still have good eyesight. One more, one more day. And they thought it was a good idea to, to, to tie like a rope or a chain, I think it was a rope or a chain around the base of a shrub and attach it to the bumper of a bus. Plenty of buses here at First Baptist Church. Right out front here, there's some shrubs right in front of the school entrance over there. And they attached those shrubs there and dropped the bus in the drive and hit the floor, hit, hit, the, hit the pedal and promptly ripped the bumper off the back of the bus. Not because the shrub had beautiful shrubbery. Not because it had been freshly watered. Not because it wasn't evergreen, though that's what it was, but because it had a strong, help me, oh, you're familiar with this. You know how this works. Maybe you've gone like me and been caught in the hole of YouTube sometimes, and I've watched people do this with vehicles and cars and trucks and ripping out the, under, the underbody of vehicles, thinking, what idiots, and thankfully myself having missed that opportunity in life. I want to challenge us this year to be rooted. It will be rooted in Jesus Christ. I've been praying, I mentioned this last week, and I'll mention it throughout this year, throughout this month particularly, that God would grow this church. Now, that's not just numerically, though that may be one aspect, but that God would grow the, the men and women, the boys and girls, the grandparents, the husband, the wife, the single, the, the, the adult, the teenager, the, the young child, that he would grow all of us in him this year, in him. It would be a year that would be well done in his sight if we grow and take steps forward. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 6, if you please look there in your Bibles. Paul writes these words under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. As ye there have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. As ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You know, there are times that we get spoiled, we get corrupted, we have the wrong thought process. Resulting in wrong decisions, wrong actions, wrong attitudes, sometimes even with good intentions. And Paul says, beware, because there is something that will spoil you, that, that, will, that will infiltrate your, your mind, that will not bring you to the point where you should be, but will take you to the place that you shouldn't be. And he delineates that place, that any place that is apart from Christ is a place you and I shouldn't be. It doesn't matter what it looks like. There are some times that we can be good attenders at church and be apart from Jesus Christ. We can have a high and lofty and a proud attitude. Well, I'm better than so-and-so because I have a bigger Bible and I go to church more. But we can be as far from Christ. And Paul says, beware, because the marker... The litmus test are those things that are not or for 
Jesus Christ. Verse number 9 and 10, For in him, that is Jesus Christ, dwell of all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Lord, we have a few moments this morning to look at your word. Lord, I ask that in the next few moments that you would help us to see you in this passage. But Lord, beyond that, would you reveal ourselves, reveal us to us. The light of your word would illuminate those areas in our heart, our mind, our attitude, our perspective, our thinking, that does not line up with the truth from your word. And Lord, that we would have the obedience and willingness to change this morning by your grace and strength. Lord, I'd ask that you would grow this church this year. That at the end of 2023, Lord, we would see your hand mightily at work in the lives, in the hearts, the people here this morning. Lord, I pray that we'd reach more people for the cause of Christ and the kingdom, but that everything that we do would honor and please you and would be after Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask for your help and blessing on this time. In Jesus' name I ask and pray. Amen. We live in what they say has been labeled a postmodern world. In philosophy and decisions, and what that, or how that translates to you and to me, is that we live in a time period where truth is relative. Meaning that truth, what is true, gets to be decided by anyone. All right, not just by a select group of scholars or what is proven to be true. You know, there's certain things that are proven to be true. Laws, like a law of gravity. Right, you realize that, right? That they can prove that. You can prove that today. You can do a little science experiment during church. You can go up in the balcony, you can jump off the balcony. And you can demonstrate and prove the law of gravity. Now, please don't do that. All right, we all believe in it because we're all still seated in our seats, all right? But there are things that are, that are proven to be true. But in this postmodern idea, truth is relative. Meaning whatever I view it to be, how I interpret it, then that is the truth in my world. And you can't tell me otherwise. This is why uh, there is the attack on marriage. Marriage can be redefined, or they want to be redefined, based on truth or their view of truth. Gender, freedom, all of that being redefined based on how I view and what I see. Everything in this con concept is shaped by my context. Postmodern. Now, on the screen, they're going to display a, a piece of artwork for you. This is postmodern art. Right here. At its finest. This is a famous piece of postmodern art. Can you not tell? Oh, oh, you thought it was scribbles on a page. Uh, you thought we went down to the nursery this morning and gave them a box of crayons and said, hey, draw something for Pastor Sermon. Now listen, I have young, I've, I've had young children. Mine are not real, but they've had young children. They've brought me pictures before. When they're real young at two, three, and four, and they say, hey, daddy, you know, here's a picture for you. And I've asked a question, well, what is it? I have no idea what it is. Oh, they do. And they're like, oh, daddy, that's you. Oh, that's the large one. And, and that's me. Oh, you have all the money. Okay, all right, Danielle, I get it now. And, uh, and there's the dragon. Oh, who's the dragon? Well, that's mommy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I'll pay for that later on. <sighs> but in for a dollar, all of my going. <laughs> You, but you, you with young children, you understand these things. You've had these pictures before. And you understand that as they get a little bit older, they, they draw more pictures, and you can begin to determine who is who. Like, oh, oh, that's me, and, and that's you, and that's mommy, and what's this? Oh, that's the unicorn you're buying me, Dad. Of course. But this on the screen, what, what is this? No, oh, my friends, this is modern art. And you've seen the, the jokes about some of this modern art. That people will stand in front and begin to just let it like wash over them. Do me a favor and look at that picture for a minute. Let it wash over you for a second. Now, this picture actually has a title. It does. It's called The Fallen. Now, now you all knew that, of course. Now, no, well, you didn't? 
You can determine that just by looking at a line of scribbles on a piece of paper or artwork or canvas, whatever it is. The sad thing is, the sad, just horrible concept of this is that they make a lot of money with this right here. And what's sad about that is I didn't think of it first. Because I could do this. My wife is an artist. Her sister is a fabulous artist. And there's some things in our house that they've done. It's, it's gorgeous. Things I could never do. There's a, a, a drawing on our wall, which is a stipple drawing. Every, every part of the drawing is a dot. Little dots. This whole, it's, it's a whole scene of these deer in the forest. Every leaf, the outline is, are dots. Anything that appears to be solid is not. It's all dots. And they just go out this thing and just put dots on a paper. And Listen, I can put dots on a paper, but you'll get no picture from it. But you'd look at that and you'd say, oh, that's deer, and that's wow. I look at this and I'm like, what a mess. What a mess. But my friends, this is the concept of a postmodern world. Where everything gets to be interpreted the way I view it. If I can direct our attention along these, this mindset that, my friends, there are people whose lives look like this. A bunch of squiggly lines on a piece of paper, and then others say, wow, that's beautiful. That's a life. And we look at it and say, that's, that's a life? That's, that's what joy is? That's what contentment looks like? That's what satisfaction? Because I'm looking at the same thing they're looking at, and I don't see it. And my friends, we have a picture. We have a picture. That we don't have to stare at and twist our eyes upside down and try to see something hidden inside of it. You see, in this context, in this postmodern world, how you're raised makes a difference. How you feel makes a difference. How you see that, what your intentions were. My friends, if we're not careful, we will succumb to this thought process with our Christianity and with our spirituality. That my feelings will take the place of the truth from God's word. That my culture or how I was raised, that, that brings more bearing to the situation than what Jesus Christ has given to me. And how I view it is most important, even more important, than how God views it. This is the danger that we can succumb to. That, well, I know what the Bible says, but I feel, well, what this says to me, see how dangerous those lines of the devil slide in to our thought. And what it produces are weak people in their minds small in their thoughts and faith, barren in our relationships, anemic in our character, frail in our spiritual walk, understanding, faith, and relationship with our God. And we are called, you and I are called, to be rooted in Jesus Christ. There's an unsettling desire for churches to reinterpret worship based on their own context. To put a mishmash of lines on a page and say, this is worship. My friends, the scripture is filled with a mishmash of worship that God has clearly rejected time and time and time again. We have an unhealthy call. Instead of preaching that is founded upon the scripture, that is life-changing and devil-defeating and addiction-crushing. No, instead, we want a spiritual shot of morphine. Make me feel good today. And there's an uncontrollable focus on self. Where you and I, the Christians, are consumed, not with Jesus Christ, but with ourself. Oh, it comes out in nice ways. Well, I didn't get anything today. I didn't, I didn't get that, meaning like the purpose of church was for me, not to honor God himself. Well, I don't, I don't like that, thereby saying that I am the highest authority to determine all decisions. 
what I like, what I dislike. There's unhealthy focus, uncontrolled focus on self. Rather than spending time with our Savior who suffered, bled, and died for us, we squeeze in a thought and a prayer and go on our merry way, unchanged, unchallenged, untransformed. Never being distracted from our little schedules. You know that we are called Christians? Right? Christians, right? We're called Christians. Or little Christs. You know that, right? That's our title. Little Christ. Christians or little anointed ones. Christ means anointed one. We're little anointed ones. It was originally supposed to be a, a demeaning title. Oh, you're just a little Christ. But my friends, we wear that proudly now, do we not? We wear we, we proudly. Little Christ. Understand that even by that title, even by that title, that title brings a context that title brings a designation, and that title brings and ought to bring a depth of meaning to our life. We are not called little Pauls, little Spurgeons, heaven forbid, little Howells. Right? That's not what we're called. We are called little Christs. But I have to wonder in our life how much of it is actually of Jesus Christ. How much when we're hooked up to the bus of life and the troubles of the chains of life are hooked around our shrub and the troubles of life hit that pedal of the metal, are we solid and secure and do we tear the bumper off the back of the trouble of life? Or does that little bus of trouble yank us out of the ground? This is the calling to be rooted in Jesus Christ. He wants us to be rooted, grounded, established in the truth. There is no greater call in our life. The next few moments this morning, just quickly this morning, I'm going to fly over this passage. We're just doing a flyby. The next few weeks we will come back and we will jump in with both feet into the deep end to allow Jesus to, to thoroughly cleanse us, clean us up and, and, and work us through. But I want to give us a flyover with three aspects this morning from this passage. All right? They'll be on your screen. Just three quick aspects of this flyover as we look at being rooted in Jesus Christ. Because, my friends, the danger in this culture is to be surface-level Christian. To be surface level means that, that I show up to church, that I carry a Bible, and that Jesus is a part of my life. That's surface level Christian. But here are three aspects to be rooted from this passage. Look in verse number six, please, turn your attention there, where Paul says this, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. The first aspect to have not a service level but a deep level is to do this, to abide in Jesus. If we're going to be rooted in Jesus, we have to abide in Jesus. Paul says this, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus, that means that there was a time in your life, like there was a time in my life, when I put my faith, my trust in Jesus Christ. Well, I remember when I realized that I was a sinner, that I deserved to pay for my sin. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I asked Jesus Christ to save me from my sins. A priest did not ask that for me. My parents did not ask that for me. It was me at six years old, individually, asking forgiveness for my sins from Jesus Christ. And I received the gift of God. I received Jesus Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. That's what this verse is talking about. And there's never been a time in your life when you have received Jesus Christ. My friend, make today the day that you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Paul says, once we have received Christ Jesus, don't set him aside. 
Don't put them to the back burner and say, oh, well, I have Jesus, so I'll just live my life my own way, and I can't be bothered with him. No, he says, as ye have therefore received him, so walk ye in him, or abide in Jesus. Jesus said it this way, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Abide in me, and I in you, all as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except that abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I read a story about a man who was outside his house after a spring storm. There was a large limb that broke on his cherry tree. And he'd come out after the storm, and he was surprised to see this branch that was hanging on by a thread, just a thread of tether between the cherry tree and this branch. And he was shocked to see that there were still cherry blossoms on this branch. That though it was cut, it was not completely severed. Intrigued by this, he began to watch it over the course of the year and the summer. Surprisingly enough, even fruit began to grow on this branch from the cherry tree that had been almost completely severed. He documented this, and he made this, though this observation. He noticed that although it bore fruit, it did not bear as much fruit or as big of fruit or as flourishing of fruit as the branches that were firmly attached to the tree. Jesus says this. He said, you've got to abide in me to bear fruit. Why does it seem that some Christians have a lot of fruit and others have just a little bit? You know why? Because some are better attached to Jesus Christ than others. Now, if you're a Christian, you're attached. All right? You're not separate. You're attached. But Jesus said, if you want to bring forth much fruit... All right, the big fruit, the flourishing fruit, then you've got to be all the way attached to me or abide in Jesus Christ. How attached to you are you to Jesus Christ? You say, Pastor, I'm attached. I remember when I got saved. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That, that is the best decision I believe someone can ever make in their life to trust in Jesus Christ. But after that, have you set him aside are you attached but, but hanging on by a thread? Again, I'm not talking about church attendance, though that's part of it. You can come to church every week and still be attached by a thread. Listen, going to church no more makes you a Christian than sitting in the refrigerator makes you a cucumber. Right? You can be here and not be attached to Jesus Christ. We've got to abide in him. You know, how do I abide in him, Pastor. What does that look like? Well, how do you abide at your house? How do you do that? Well, I, I go home, and I walk in the door, and I stay there. Well, let's take that apart real quick. You go home. You make a decision to be somewhere. Right? You make a decision. It takes some actions to go home, does it not? I can say right now, I'm home, but I'm not home. I'm not fooling anybody. It takes, it takes some actions to go home. And it takes a decision to be there. But after I'm there, it just means I'm inside, I'm inside of this surrounding. Someone asked a great preacher once, well, were you walking with Jesus when you were sleeping? Don't ask me that question. I'll shake my head and slap you. No, I won't do that. The person was trying to, to pick at. And this great preacher said, he said, well, I'm a, when I'm at home, I'm asleep in my bed. Am I still at home? The man said, yes. He said, that's the same way with Jesus Christ. Listen, if you're going to abide in Jesus Christ, you and I have to make a decision to be there. Make a decision to be there. Make a decision to pick up his word. I believe abiding in Jesus has just a couple, uh, a couple of aspects to it. I would say abiding in Jesus means to be in fellowship with Jesus and to be in communication with Jesus. If you're in fellowship and communication, then you're on your way to abiding with Jesus Christ. Not only must we abide with Jesus, my friends, the second aspect of this, we must be established on Jesus. 
Verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. That means to draw strength from Jesus, to trust the truth from Jesus. Now, we'll jump into this in a couple weeks, but I read this. It was so interesting. There are some trees, and they're the elm trees, that might have as many as 14 million roots. Now, I'm this guy. Maybe you're not, but I'm going to take you down this path. Who counted that? All right, who, <laughs> who, and not so much who counted it, but who made the guy count it or girl count it? Like, your job today, yep, there, Jimmy, you're counting roots. How long, sir, till you're done? 14 million. <laughs> and then they say there may be as many as 14 billion tiny little root hair, hairs. When the Bible talks about being a root in Jesus Christ, it's not talking just about one big tap root, though that's a great concept. We'll look at that. It's talking a bit about being firmly planted and established on Jesus Christ. Root after root after root, dug in deep. I believe in the truth of Jesus. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He is the word. What's amazing is that those roots will then elevate the water in a tree sometimes over 100 feet off the ground. It's a great picture for us, and I won't jump too far here, but I want you to think about this. There are times in life when we get knocked, right, slapped upside the head, kicked in the gut. And maybe you've seen someone who seems to have this supernatural joy that's not based up here on the winds and the storm, but based from down here. And when you're firmly established on Jesus Christ, when trouble comes, the word of God, Jesus Christ, brings and elevates that water, that nourishing water, that everlasting water from the root system. And it fills you. It overcomes. It bears fruit outside. And people look at it and say, what's happening there? You know what's happening? That person's firmly planted, established on Jesus Christ. And that word, that truth, that's coming right up and coming out. How does that happen? Supernatural. We're abiding in Jesus. We're established on Jesus. But number three, we're satisfied with Jesus. And ye are complete, verse 10, in him which is the head of all principality and power. We can have purpose but no power, and that's meaningless. We can have power and no purpose, that's chaos. But with Jesus Christ, we have purpose and power. Or we can say it this way, when I'm full of Jesus, he has all of me, and I am filled up with him. He has all of me, and I am filled up with Jesus. When I spend time with him, I break out in a smile and a song because I'm having all of him and I want him to have all of me. Someone said this, the soul's deepest thirst is for God himself. Someone wrote these words, my faith is found a resting place not in device nor creed. I trust the ever living one. His wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. To abide in Jesus, to be established on Jesus and satisfied with Jesus. There's three more pictures I'd like you to see on the screen, if you would, please. You've seen this first one. What is it? Someone knows. Someone knows. Someone even says it's art. I would say it's a mess. See the next picture, please? Another very famous piece of artwork. Set of lines. This one, I believe, is a very aptly named piece of artwork. When I tell you, I think you're going to chuckle about it. This one is called The Unknown. Right? Like I, like I chuckled. I'm like, yep, you nailed it. You nailed it. And yet they sold it for a whole lot of money. Unless I'm changing my career, I'm going to be an artist. And there's one more, like you see. Now, when I tell you this one, you're actually, you can actually start to see this. Ready? This is called, like, the kangaroos. 
Now, do you see the kangaroos? It's like one of those 3D things as you, as you draw away and squint your eyes, you start to see more. Right? You look at it like, oh, I can start to see it. My friends, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, even though we're called little Christians or little Christs, our lives look like these paintings. That if we're not abiding in Jesus, if we're not established on Jesus, and we're not satisfied with Jesus, then others will look and they'll say, what's that? Oh, it's the unknown. It's, it's a Christian life. What? It looks like a mess to me. I'm afraid that the Lord looks down upon us sometimes. He's given us the utensils, the truth, the artistry to do this. And I wonder if he looks down at our life, at your and my life, and he says, what is that? Well, Lord, it's the life you gave me. A child. Well, that's a mess. And yet, we begin to abide in Jesus Christ, firmly attached to him. We're established on Jesus, firmly set and resting on him. And when we're satisfied with Jesus and resting in him, our lives will be a beautiful masterpiece that will bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. What does your life look like? Not what you think it looks like. Not what you're titling it as. This is the fallen, the unknown, the kangaroos. Not what you claim it to be like, but what is it actually? If there's anything different from the word of God, we must get back to being rooted in him.